Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this City Nature Challenge Nature Chat. Um, over the bank holiday weekend, over 3,000 people were out snapping photos of nature in their, on their doorsteps and sending them in via the free iNaturalist app for the International City Nature Challenge. Um, and this year, the challenge saw over 400 regions worldwide, 14 of them in the UK, working together to put wildlife on the map. Um, across the whole UK, uh, the 3,000 of you have uploaded over 54,000 wildlife observations already, uh, which is absolutely astounding. Um, the chance actually to take photos as part of the challenge, which uh, happened over the weekend, has now uh, finished. But we have a few days left to upload and process any last sightings um, before the final tally is announced on the 10th of May. Um, and this afternoon, we're going to be geeking out live with some of the UK's top wildlife experts, whilst we ask you to help us identify some of the unknown species that have been found over the weekend um, and pick out some of the real highlights that we can then share uh, some of those stories. Full instructions for how to take part in that data blitz um, of uh, pulling out that um, interesting data can be found in the uh, link. There's a link in the uh, video description um, and you'll be able to um, interact with us live uh, now as well via the comments um, on this video as well. Um, so for our first uh, nature chat, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Erica McAllister from the Natural History Museum. Um, and Eric is going to start us off with a little bit about um, why flies um, as her species of interest. So welcome, Erica. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, can I have my first slide? Here you go. So um, I've been very lucky enough to be working on flies for a very long time now, about 15, 20 years, which I guess isn't that long, really, in terms of flies and people who are working on things. But the, one of the things that's extraordinary about flies is there's a lot of them. And this is not just in the UK. This is globally. We've got about 165,000 species described so far. So they're one of the mega diverse groups. But what I really like in the UK, there's over 7,000 of them. So there's more butterflies, there's more flies than there are butterflies and moths and beetles. So it doesn't matter where you are, you're basically going to come across some flies. So there's a lot of species, but there's a lot of numbers of species within those species as well. So there's a lot of abundance, even like it's really <laughs> overcast where I am right now. And um, there's still flies out. So they're quite hardy individuals. You name it, they get it. And why they're important is because they have their little tarsi, their little feet, in every ecological niche. It's like if I was an animal, I'd be a fly because they're incredibly nosy. They're both predators, both predators, parasites, parasitoids, herbivores, et cetera, et cetera. You can read it on the list. And very importantly, they're some of the best pollinators. So it's really important we start studying and observing some of the most beautiful creatures to understand what's going on. So I've just been looking around my garden. I spend a lot of time in my garden now, thanks to my working off this being just here. And this year alone, these are some of the beasties that I've been uncovering. Um, if anyone knows me, you know that I have this absolute love of bee flies. It, have you seen bee flies, Matt? Love bee flies. Like they, they seem to be just popping up all over uh, the social media at just at the right time of year. You see the right. I, I get jealous as well every time like someone else has seen a bee fly. I like. Uh, there's um. It's been amazing, and we've been thanks to a lot of online resources. We've been really tracking the populations recently. So in my garden, I get this one here, Bombylius major. But I've also been lucky to see the Bombylius um, discola, the spotted bee fly. And it's been really great because not only now are we taking records of when they're emerging as adults, we can see observations about where their larvae are feeding, but we can look at the differences between the sexes because this is really easy to see on our pictures. So if the eyes are touching at the top of their head, you've got males and if they're not, they're females. This is a little cold male. He's been very, very um, affectionate to me because he's very cold, bless him. Not because I'm adorable. But we are now being able to take those records, and this is what everyone's helping us. So we're understanding way more about population distribution. Hoverflies, they're a lovely group to work on, and a lot of them are quite easy. And I'm going to talk about like, some key texts uh, to help everyone with them. And again, these are some of the early, um, early insects into our garden. 
the one on the top left is this uh, one of the drone hoverflies. And that is a really important uh, pollinator as an adult, but its larvae are part of the rat-tailed maggots. So they're really, really good fun to actually observe and watch them. You know, they breathe out of their bottom. I mean, what more could you want from an animal? And also in the same group of these rat-tailed maggots, you've got on the, to the right, the bottom right, that's the Batman hoverfly, arguably the coolest common name. And you can see why it's called Batman hoverfly because it's got the call of the bat on its back. So these group hoverflies are a really nice, simple way of, 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 of introducing you to some of the obvious pollinators in the garden. The other one I've got here is a little Upioides. This is one that's got a lovely looping abdomen. And this, again, when you're taking photos, when you've got to start thinking about how you identify them, because with a lot of these, we identify them by their face, their abdomen markings, and by patterns on their legs. So if you can, when you're taking photographs, take quite a few. But this one, this has got brilliant larvae that are aphidophagus, so they eat aphids. And then, so they're really good, not only as adult pollinators, but their larvae are just munching through all your common garden pests. Sorry to the aphids, especially. <laughs> a highlight, though, is this one on the top right, which is a kinid. Uh, Steve Fawkes calls these punk flies because they are so bristly. And I think I'm definitely adopting that as a common name for the group. <laughs> and they are parasites. Their larvae are parasitoids. And these feed on lots of caterpillars and things like that. And a lot of them are really, really helpful for us. And they're eating a lot of things that we do not want in our gardens. And also things like oak procession moth. We're now learning that some of these can be really important for that. And they just look brilliant. I definitely squealed when this came out in the garden. So there's easy ways for you to start getting into flies. Diptus Forum. Really brilliant society. Obviously, I'm slightly biased because it's all about flies. It's very cheap, um, lots of users. And you can see here, I've just taken a screen grab of their um, uh, web uh, site, and they've got lots of recording schemes. So anytime you see any of these flies, you can go along, you can ask for help, you can ask for identification, and you can upload your records here. So this is really, really good. We've got some exciting data going on. These recording schemes, such as the crane fly recording scheme, which in a couple of years' time is 50 years old. 50 years of people going around the country identifying crane flies, which makes me very happy. And if you want help with looking at images to compare your specimens, look no further than Steve Falk's Flickr site. Again, I've put a link up here because this man is basically a legend when it comes to photography. And he's so good at identifying them. He's got a free online access so you can go and compare what's going on. Some really useful resources. Amazing. That's my little... Yeah. I mean, Steve has been brilliant. I mean, people will know him maybe for the bees, but we know for the flies. He's just an incredibly helpful. And if you go online, if you go to either Facebook and Twitter, and you can ask for help with IDs there. So everyone is a really active community wanting to help people. I suppose that that's one of the great things as well, isn't it? About, I suppose, when you start looking at, you know, going from maybe some of the really broad ways of people getting interested in, you know, maybe for the first time starting to look a bit more closely at, at, at um, you know, some of the nature on, on their doorstep. When you start looking at things in a more specialist group area as well, you get to meet some extraordinary people and some people have really, dedicated their lives down Absolutely. to, to um, you know it, it goes beyond hobbyism i suppose doesn't yeah. it? it it becomes an obsession well we, we don't say obsession well. <laughs> it's a great liking i mean I, 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 I yes a great liking i'm terrible at a lot of fly species i you know there's seven thousand of us there and my brain mm. is not that big and so i rely heavily on the wider community to help me once you've got it into a family and things like that, then you can say, and then somebody goes, oh yeah, it's that, or, or they give you help, like actually with this family, what you need to think about is the bristle arrangement or something like that. So there's a lot of people, thankfully, who are much better equipped than I am to help identify all these things. I suppose, would you think that there'd be a thing, because I think, you know, flies get, uh, in, they, they're not the first on people's list, are they, quite often? <laughs> Like you said about butterflies and moths and things like that. Do you think people are maybe uh, 
what do you think that is? Do you think it's maybe a, a historical context or is it because yeah. are, are people intimidated? Do they feel like flies are difficult um, well, to, to look at or, um, or is it a kind of, do, or is it the association of sort of saying, if I want to be a fly person, I need to be hanging around the bins or, yeah, what do you think so, it might I be? Mean, um, there are some bin flies, there's no getting around it, but there's some beautiful bin flies. In fact, there's one compost fly that um, your cuckoo's pint, your lords and ladies, it it kidnaps this fly. It pretends to smell like a compost. It kidnaps this fly for 24 hours till it pollinates it. So what is interesting is that a lot of things that we initially thought were just like doing one thing are tricked into doing that. So ecologically, we are only just beginning to scrape the surface of these beautiful and bizarre creatures. Now, they, some of them are really hard, I'm not going to lie, and some of them will need a microscope. There's definitely going to be around that. But there's a lot that you don't need. Like, there's over 300 species of hoverfly, and that little guide is, like, your, your absolute gem for helping you understand a lot of the hoverflies. And Roger and Stuart have done some really good, really easy introductions into tribes, into the subfamilies, etc., to help you out. And then there's also, like, if you want to go more advanced, this is our new wonderful book. And this is um, Blowfly. Now, Blowflies are are really under under liked, shall we say, because a lot of them, they do hang around with decomposing feces, dead bodies, generally, but they've got other aspects to them as well. And they're really, really interested in ecology. And this is really nice. And it's got thousands of pictures in. So that's what's really good about some of these guides now. So mm. where we were 10 years ago to where we are now in helping people with flies is a completely different environment. I suppose but that would be the book as well if you're if you're maybe you know with the uh, the surge of uh, you know if you're into your true crime podcast um then uh, then maybe some, uh, a bit of blowfly fly research is in, in the new way as well and of course yeah. uh, no, you know, I mean, <laughs> That was subtle, Eric. It was. <laughs> thanks, thanks. But um, no, no, there, there's so much because they, there's there's the forensics, there's um, pollination services, there's everything that they're beginning, and we're really beginning to look at them as not just those annoying ones that buzz around us, but you know how helpful they are. The the migrating hoverflies. They come from North Africa. They come all this way. They're doing a really important job of eating uh, the pests of our crops and pollinating our flowers and things like that. And, and it is so easy. A lot of them, again, really easy to identify. It's a really nice um, animals to get into. And even the sneaky flies, those bee flies, you know, there's a whole lot of sneakiness going on with them, but they're adorable. <laughs> Never trust pretty things. That's a life. <laughs> but they're, they're, it's really good. But how much does it annoy you as well that the bees and butterflies get all the uh, get all the attention um, when it comes to the um, pollinator story as well? I just I generally just politely point out that we are missing a lot of the stories, especially like you know there's four thousand species of insect described in the Arctic, two thousand are our flies. So when it comes to like hold on, I think there's a lot more going on. Even your little cosmopolitan house fly, we're now realising, is doing way more important jobs in pollinating in a lot of habitats. So we're getting the word out there. And the more we have people taking images of them interacting with different plants, different flies, you know, we've got them with different pollen, things like that. This is really helpful for us. Fantastic. And so if people have had a go this weekend as part of the City Nature Challenge with the iNaturalist app, there's also other kind of um, more in-depth ways to get involved as well. You pointed out some yeah. of the um, more uh, in-depth citizen science yeah, opportunities. Yeah. To and get what I love, well. yeah, and what I absolutely adore, because I've got iNaturalist, I, I use it all the time because I use it for the botany. And it is really helpful for us to look at what plants different species are feeding from. So again, your photo, you might just be taking it for one thing, but actually all of it has so much useful information. It's really good. So it gives you a tiny, tiny picture of the ecology as well when you see yeah. what 
what the uh, what the creature's saying. And that's a good tip as well for if we're trying to uh, boost up our numbers for the Disinated Challenge, if people took <laughs> photos of an insect um, at uh, during the City Nature Challenge but didn't record the plant it was sitting on, um, then of course that would count as another record if it, if uh, people want to up their personal score in the uh, in the challenge as well. So that's that's a, a useful segue for that as well. I tell you, I wanted to bring up as well because I, I was listening to some of the uh, some of the names that you were reeling off as well when you were there. Because I wonder if um, you know if people are, uh, worry about kind of looking at flies and thinking that they're going to have to learn a lot of Latin um, to be able to do it. But I think certainly in terms of some of the family names. There's some really memorable ones in there that are much easier than some of the butterflies that are like, you know, large white, I think is the singularly least imaginatively named yeah. animal in the world. But, you know, things like rat-tailed maggots, Batman hoverflies, punk flies, you know, there's there's a lot that's memorable in there. But it, it, when it, things like with the Batman hoverfly, once you've seen it, you're like, oh, yeah, that's it. Nothing <laughs> else, else looks like it. Rat-tailed maggots, pretty, you know... They're very, very much, but even the the scientific name of the hoverflies, which the rat tail maggots come in, is surfidae. So I was thinking about them surfing on the earth. And there you go, you've just remembered your first family of flies. So there's I have I've got a bad brain. So it always kind of <laughs> associates things differently. So it's quite useful. But yeah, um uh, many of them don't have common names, but that's because they maybe there's thousands that all look alike so it's quite yeah. difficult small black fly there there's a, a useful <laughs> common name with some of the families but yeah we have tried to do, do it and steve's actually a huge um one for giving common names to absolutely everything to help people <laughs> learn things fantastic um and i think there's there's kind of part of that, that that leads on as well from from the names side of thing is thinking about you know that that point of lots of species that look alike and this is something particularly in, in the invertebrate world in general there's there's maybe something that people struggle with and people may find that when when looking at iNaturalist records for example where you know you're looking at potentially one photo which is maybe not from yeah. the best angle or um, things like that is it does make things a little bit more challenging than if you've got a, a specimen in front of you as yeah. well um but I suppose is there kind of are there useful points as well on a lot of the flies around the kind of how can you tell two sort of identical looking species from very different ecology maybe or are there you know if you see something in a particular place or with a particular plant it's more likely to be one than the other or exactly I mean all of these are really useful observations because if it if it's a uh, a fly that's only found on coastal dunes and you identify it in the middle of a forest you're the probability is that it's an incorrect identification. So again, these are all useful. And this is really, so even if you just go to the family and you identify it to that level, but write these um, ecological data down, that helps the, the expert to go, hold on, that I can narrow it down further now. So it, it, it's all very important. Mm -hmm. And um, when, again, when taking photos, I, I say try and take as many as possible because we will be looking for various various things uh, that are quite common amongst all the flies as well as later on when we're working it down to species there may be one or two individual angles which you won't know about obviously but everything helps. Fantastic. I suppose that's one of the things that when that we're asking people to do today, as well as part of the is looking back at some of that City Nation Challenge data and where people have put down quite a lot of the observations just get listed as unknown. Um, and even putting something as like this is a fly um, is is enough to then bring it to the attention of someone who is who is looking absolutely. at the flies. Um, yeah, as well. absolutely. Because, you know, that straight away, it can be filtered down that avenue. What is interesting is how many people will not realise it's a fly when they've taken the photo. Mm. So there's a straight off because flies are, are, are I think that there's this kind of like, I don't want to identify it as a fly, I'm going to call it a bee or a wasp or something like that. And then you mm. look at it and it's like, no, that's not. So your basic, basic thing, has, has it got one pair of wings? Has it got two pairs of wings? You may not realise till you've got a nice clear stationary shot of them. And other little telltale things between the bees and the flies is the, the heads and the eyes and bees' eyes in comparison to flies' eyes and the antennae. 
like um, a lot of the bees are <laughs> can't believe you're making me be a bee <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made you do anything, Erica. You've gone straight in for that on your own. But now, but now that you've started. Yeah, I can do all the animals, but no, stop. Um, you say you can look at little things like that and you generally start to kind of work out. You get an understanding on their morphology the more you look at all of these. So spend hours going through your, all your images to work out what you're going on. Amazing. We've had a question come in as well, which is uh, a really interesting one from uh, Rosemary, which is, um, it's generally accepted that a few centuries ago, humans were on average shorter than we are now. And is it known if this applies to flies and other insects? Or are they larger now than they were centuries ago? So have we seen a sort of change in, uh, is there um, an evolution of uh, the insects and flies that, that we've seen sort of within recent history? Well, this is interesting, and this is where our collections do come into fall, because we, I, I, I was looking at a mosquito yesterday that was over 120 years old, and what we can do now is we can look at species, especially now we, we can look at your photos and we can measure them, and we can say now whether we think certain insects have grown or got smaller. It is interesting because some may, because of um, a change in climate, some may squeeze in another generation and in doing so they may put more resources into making the next generation than making themselves bigger so we may say get three generations instead of two generations a year but they're going to be smaller flies so all of this we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of, of understanding what's going on morphologically but yeah it's it's we are now at the point where we can start incriminating previous collections and and previous flies, etc., see what's going on. It is a problem with certain flowers that are designed, garden flowers, ornamental flowers that are for smelling, and they all look pretty in our gardens, but they may not have the nectar reserves. So these may be causing food shortages to a lot of our insects. So we do have to pay attention to what we plant and what we have in our gardens. You could do my way of gardening, pretty hands off. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I get lots of things here. I let in nature dictate what it wants in my garden. <laughs> mm. So it's kind of, yeah, so you leave, leave things to nature to be able to take over as well. But I suppose that, that kind of that raises a couple of questions as well off, off the back of that I was thinking was, um, was one around kind of what people can do, be either in their gardens or um, for people who don't have gardens, thinking about, you know, how they can um, maybe support. And I, I imagine it's very difficult to write a letter to your MP try in, in speaking up for your local flies in the parks. But yeah. I, I think if well, you can try and lump them in with the other pollinators, use yeah, the poster boy bees. Well, this is it. I mean, there's some basic thing. Even if you don't have a garden, you think about what you consume. And this is the number one thing. It's And also just ridiculously simple things. Turn the tap off. OK, because the water resources are often a finite resource in a lot of areas. And if we're removing water for the environment for us, we're actually re removing it from a lot of the habitat. And this habitat may be a larval habitat for a lot of these insects. So just turn that tap off when you're brushing. It's just ridiculously simple. Try to use less products that um, uh, have maybe had some um, insecticides and things like that. Try to go for a more uh, more natural, more organic approach to certain products. Um, just tiny little consumer things. But if you do have a garden and you want to think about how to make that better and you 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 don't mind so much, then put in different habitats, put in a log pile, put in a load of broken pots, dig a pond, have a bucket, because we've got to start thinking about the entire life cycle of the insect. We don't just need the plants. That is really good for the adults, but the larval stage is really, really important to get to the adult stage. So we've got to create all these little larval habitats. I've got a really small stinky pond, okay? And it's really great. Because the other day when I properly, it, it got a leak in it, so I had to repair it. And when I was repairing it, four hoverflies joined me and started overpositioning. They started laying their eggs in front of me because it was a load of disgusting mud. 
and they like nothing better than this mud for their larvae. And so it filled me with great joy that my tiny little repair had opened up a little habitat for them to come along for the next generation to develop from. Amazing. So it is really just about that kind of those two main things of, of you know, taking less out of uh, that, that kind of habitat space and out of that natural world um, and, and kind of reducing that consumer footprint. But but yeah. then also really looking at that diversity of habitats that you can create and doing lots of I mean, things. Absolutely. I mean, I spend my time just staring. <laughs> just, you know, and don't tell my boss that. <clears throat> Uh, but I do, I do spend a lot of time. It's fine. We're not. It's not like we're live or anything. <laughs> but the whole thing is, I have a tiny postage stamp, and and there's what when you start looking, you realise that there's more and more and more and more. And this is what got me involved in the first place was suddenly realising, oh, there's you know people go, there's a robin in my garden. That's it. No, wait, wait, wait. Add the other two thousand, three thousand species. That you can't see the underground that are there crawling in the trees everything like that it's it's a it's a huge safari amazing i'd like just to bring in so we've got another question come in from uh victor as well which brings us right back to uh recording which so uh which might be where we'll need to end as well um as as we're sort of coming <laughs> to the end of our time but um Erica, I suppose, what would be the kind of priority features to photograph? We talked about making sure we get lots of photographs of, of a specimen to, to help with that identification. Um, and Victor's actually followed up as well with any tips on separating fly larvae from other wiggly things um, <laughs> as well. Right. So tips, wings. OK, so the venation of the wings is really important. So we can separate into families and we can even go subfamilies, sometimes species. Um, some of them have colourful marks on their wings, so we know exactly what's going on there. You then want to look at heads, um, because a lot of them will have uh, the way their eyes are arranged, their antennae, where the antennae sit, where they've got a band, those sorts of things. Abdomen and back patterns. So if you can get a good clear one of, say, if a fly's resting like that, and you've got, here's my maggot, you can take a nice little view straight down and you can say, okay, that's really good. Um, here's a fly's head. We like to kind of get one straight on. That's quite handy. But if you can get one like that as well, that's really easy. Everyone's got a fly's head in their office, haven't they? Uh, all those sorts of things. Mm. So, and the banding patterns on their legs. So with those, you can get a lot. After that point, you are probably dealing with genitalia, which you're not going to get on an image. So that, yeah, so go with that. And now, you know, so make sure you get your fly's consent before that as well. Yes. No, I, I, yes, there's some terrible stories about that I won't go into. So, fly, tips on separating fly larvae. So, uh, fly larvae, in comparison to other insects, don't have legs. Um, some will have fake legs just to throw a spanner in because flies are just annoying like that. So, for example, you've got coronamids, the non biting midges. Those are your blood worms that a lot of people would have come across, but those are fly larvae. So a lot of the other immature or wiggly things, um, uh, insect-wise, will have legs, or they'll be really, really long. <laughs> so where well, you won't get ever them that being that long. They they look like, I describe them as like sleeping bags. That's kind of what a fly larvae looks like. So that's quite easy to identify. Fantastic. Well, that has run us up very, very close to the end of our time. So thank you so much, Erica, and thank you, everyone, for your uh, questions as well. Um, this video will be uh, on, on the Facebook for a little while longer as well, so that you can uh, watch back. And um, thank you so much, Erica, for um, for joining us today and, uh, and having a chat with us about flies. Um, I hope that everyone now is feeling inspired to go out and start recording the flies it's a really good time of year to um to be out photographing some of the uh insects that that you can find in the sunshine as well um that's all that we've got time for um uh, but please do check out the the rest of the uk bible it's facebook page there are going to be more of these nature chats um through the rest of the afternoon uh dropping on every hour um and do go across onto the iNaturalist app and have a go at uh, identifying some of the sightings with your newfound uh knowledge around how to identify <laughs> uh the flies on there as well uh so thank you very much Erica, and um see you all uh, online bye bye <laughs>